This is Classical Ideas with Greg Soden. Welcome to Classical Ideas. This is Greg Soden. So just for a moment, think about what springs to mind when I say three words. Christian, American, politics. Got it? When I say these three words simultaneously, I'd wager most people put together a vision in their minds over what that combination of terms looks like. It may be crystal clear to you, but your version is likely very different than if you were to ask someone else in a different neighborhood, a different state, or a different region of the United States. What it means to be Christian and be political in the United States is, frankly, complicated for many reasons. I've chatted about my views on this before and admitted to some of my own views of contradictions and disconnect between expressed statements of religiosity and how that translates into politics. It's interesting, challenging, frustrating, and enlightening. The internal diversity of all religions and American Christianity is important to consider when learning about and discussing religion. The internal diversity of religion is something I spend a great deal of time discussing and teaching about when I teach high school students about religion. American Christianity has a long and complicated history with relation to politics, and that story is now told from Reconstruction to the present day in a brand new book by Dr. Matthew Bowman at Henderson State University. His book, Christian, The Politics of a Word in America, tells the stories of figures like Victoria Woodhull, Elaine Locke, Father John Ryan, Father Charles Coughlin, Dorothy Day, the sagas of the Western Civilization course and its spawn into American school curriculum, and the challenges that that course received from Howard University. The book also talks about Bayard Rustin, Robert Bella, Jimmy Carter, white supremacists, and much more leading up to the 2016 American presidential election. Christian, the Politics of a Word in America, was just named one of the five best books in religion for 2018 by Publishers Weekly. It is excellent. I learned countless new pieces of information, and it is out now from Harvard University Press. So without further delay, please enjoy my conversation with the author, Dr. Matthew Bowman. Welcome to Classical Ideas. I'm here today with my guest, Dr. Matthew Bowman, author of the new book, Christian, the Politics of a Word in America, out now from Harvard. Matthew, thank you so much for coming on the show. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. If you can just spend a moment and sort of introduce your career to the audience, that would be very helpful. Yeah, absolutely. I am an associate professor of history at Henderson State University. Um, It is the public liberal arts college in the state of Arkansas. Um, I teach modern American history, which means more or less everything from the Civil War to the present. Um, Also, I teach uh, some religious history and Atlantic history as well. Excellent. So I kind of want to go back in time to set the stage for your work uh, and what you've wound up doing with your career. Um, can you tell us like a little bit about where you grew up and especially if like religion was a part of your life? That would be interesting as well. Yeah, certainly. I, I, I am actually a Mormon. Um, I grew up just outside of Salt Lake City um, and I went to, uh, to the University of Utah for my undergraduate degree. And I think, you know, to follow up on your second part of the question there, it it absolutely, I think, uh, led me into what I do professionally and what I was interested in studying in graduate school. You know, Mormonism is a a pretty small faith that's gotten a lot of attention in American culture and politics over the last 10 or 20 years or so. Um, When Mitt Romney ran for president, everyone was talking about the Mormon moment, you know, but that's happened every 10 years or so, I think. Um, The earlier one was when the Olympics was in Salt Lake City. I was an undergraduate 
when that happened, and I was just really interested in all the media attention that uh, the church received in these periods. And when I went to graduate school, I was initially interested in studying um, politics in America during the progressive period, um, roughly um, the chapter on Columbia University in my book was what the time period I was initially really interested in. But that led me into religious history uh, because the more I studied it, the more I came to conclude that you can't really understand American political history without understanding American religious history um, at the same time. And and the intertwining between those two questions is um, what has really occupied most of my um, intellectual interests and my professional career since. Excellent. So can you think back on a time where religion and academics sort of became intertwined for you? Like, how did those two things click into place? Oh, man, you know, um, it was in graduate school, I think, um, at Georgetown University, which is where I did my PhD. Um, and I recall a seminar I took my second year there. And a seminar is in graduate school in history is when you uh, really have to write a research paper for the first time, a professional grown-up article that could be published in a journal. And I was interested in writing an article on the socialist movement in America, um, which had its peak in the first couple of decades of the 20th century. And as I was looking more and more and more at the socialist movement, I discovered that a lot of these early socialists in the United States um, were what we might call today Christian socialists. That's what some of them called themselves. And they talked a lot about Christianity and how their Christian faith led them into socialism. And it turns out there was a great ideological divide in this early American socialist movement between Christian socialists and more orthodox Marxist socialists. And that divide is one of the reasons why the Socialist Party in the United States um, never really succeeded. Um, And that really fascinated me because, of course, today, Christian socialists seems like an oxymoron, I think, to many Americans. And and I was very, very interested in, in the notion that this could have been, you know, just a common assumption for many people in in earlier periods of the nation's history that these two would go hand in hand, and that was, um, in a lot of ways, the rabbit hole that led me down into writing about religious history, and particularly the role of religion in politics. Wow, that is such an interesting description of how you came to study American Christianity and how that came to be such a primary area of interest for you. Do you have any like? Uh, notion of like the most influential readings or books or events that really drew you into studying that? Like, what are some recommendations you would offer? Oh, certainly. Oh, boy, there there are so many. Um, and, you know, it's, it's interesting because I could, I think, point to just some classic works in American political history. Sure. One of the first books I read in graduate school was a book by a guy named Gordon Wood, um, called The Making of the American Republic, which is, it's, it's, I think some historians would say it's outmoded today, but it's still a massive landmark. Um, and the book covers essentially the American Revolution and the Constitution. Um, and it's about this um, notion of republicanism, um, which is something I talk a little bit more about in uh, my book, too. And Wood really points out that in many ways, this I- political idea of republicanism, the idea that uh, we should have a self-governing nation, um, but also that citizens should consider that a responsibility and then seek public virtue and seek to be good people in their own lives, that that idea for many of these leaders was really intertwined with Christianity. And since there have been a, a, oh, there's been a school of American historians um, who are many of them evangelicals who write about evangelical history, who have argued that those two ideas are inseparable, the notion of self-government and the notion of Christianity in the United States. But more recently, I think a lot of historians have um, really pushed as well a notion I follow up on in this book that in fact religion has offered a lot of more radical ways of thinking about what it means to be a political in the United States. Um, and I'm thinking here especially of some um, works that historians of the black freedom movement and of African American Christianity um, have written in recent years who have really pushed um, the idea of what it means to be an American and offered um, 
ways in which uh, black people in the United States have thought about that in far, far divergent ways than we traditionally understand. Um, a recent book that's really good on this is uh, Judith Weisenfeld's book, New World a Coming, um, which is about black radicalism in the early 20th century. Um, and she looks at the ways in which black religion really offered black people alternate identities, ways of thinking about who they were um, that separated them in many ways from the kind of mainstream of American life. And um, you can see some of the influence of that, I think, in my book. I love like following the threads. Whenever I talk to authors like yourself, like I wonder who inspired them and who inspired them. So I always like to follow those paths a little bit. It's so interesting. Oh, very much. Yeah, it's kind of an intellectual genealogy in a way, right? Yeah. So let's talk about your book, Christian, The Politics of a Word in America, which is out now from Harvard University Press. What questions were nagging at you about this country and its Christian people in the years leading up to the writing and publication of this book? Like, What mm -hmm. were you really curious about? You know, um, the thing that really inspired this book, I think, was the 2012 presidential election. And, and you can see that in the book. It's something I write about in the conclusion of the book. I focus on that election um, because, and I mentioned you know, Mitt Romney's run for president earlier. Um, one of the interesting things about that election, I think, was that both Romney and Obama who were self-professed Christians, who claimed to be Christians, and who said, both of them, that their faith influenced how they thought about politics in the United States, both of them faced accusations of not really being Christian. Mm -hmm. um, their claims to that word were, were controversial and contested. And I found that really fascinating. Um, the, this was such a point of controversy in, in, in you know, so recent a year as 2012, and the ways in which their faith influenced their politics was a point of controversy as well. Both of them were attacked for not really being American in some way. Um, and that, that accusation was intimately tied to their religion. Um, that question really nagged at me, and it was something that I thought a lot about. And about a year or so after that election, um, when a previous book I'd been working on was published, I began kind of digging into it and, and trying to think about how I could frame this story um, leading up to this election in a, in a narrative. Excellent. So one of the things that I do, so I, I'm a high school religious studies teacher, and I often will invite people to come into my classroom and talk about areas of interest. So say you were to come in to be a guest speaker in one of my classes, and you were standing in front of my, a Midwestern high school class of seniors during a Christianity unit talking about these topics, what would be one thing that you would want all students to walk away thinking about after you had spoken to them? Mm. I think more than anything else, uh, the notion that Christian as a concept, as a term, is not self-evident. Um, it is not something, I think, that there is an easily agreed upon definition of. And simply, you know, well, one of the things I found a lot when I was um, writing about this book is that many, many times people in politics in American history would claim to be a Christian candidate or run as the Christian candidate or claim that their political ideology was driven by Christianity. And oftentimes when they do that, they do it as though it's self-evident what that means, mm -hmm. right? That Christianity translates into a very easily describable and easily graspable set of political ideas. And what I found as I was working on this is that that's not true at all, is that the word has been invoked to describe a huge panoply of ideas, right? often mutually incompatible, yeah. um, often very controversial. I mean, I think, you know, this is one of these ideas in American history today that still is often assumed to mean a certain thing. Um, today, I think for the most part, when if a candidate is running as a Christian candidate, most people will assume that that person is socially conservative. And that's what being Christian means, is to be socially conservative, um, right? But that, that was not true as recently as 30 or 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, Christian was a much broader idea then and could have be invoked to defend a, a much wider range of politics 30 or 40 years ago in the 1960s than it is often assumed to today. And I think that definition is, is changing as well. So I want these kids to understand um, that this definition is a complicated thing. It's a thing with a history 
um, that is choppy. Right. I, I love and that. Different. Yeah, I love that. And you have a concept in the book that I think segues really well called the essentially contested concept. So the book, you, you talk a lot about the internal diversity of Christianity. And I think that everything you just said leads to the understanding that there is internal diversity that needs to be understood for future voters and students, etc. So the book discusses this concept that to me explains some of why we seem so disunified as a country right now. Can you talk a little bit more about what an essentially contested concept is and say why it matters to the internal diversity of American society, American Christianity, and the politics of the U.S. government? Sure. Uh, this is a concept I have taken from the philosopher W.B. Ghali. Um, it's an article he wrote about 60 years ago, and he argues that the essentially contested concept is something that lies very, very close to the heart of what we understand our society to mean, what I even in many ways we understand what it means to be human, but also that has no clear, readily agreed upon definition. Um, examples that Galway gives in the art um, are things like art or justice, right? These are all ideas that we have. Every one of us has a picture of in our head. We think we understand what this concept means. But if you were to sit down with a dozen other people in a room and try to hash out a definition of art, you would find that very, very difficult. <laughs> yes. Um, justice, you know, the same way, right? It's, it's a concept, he says, that from its very inception is contested. And it's actually in the argument over it over what this thing is, that it becomes so powerful. Um, when I discovered this idea, I thought, wow, you know, that really fits, I think, very well what I'm trying to say about Christianity. Um, is it, it's, it's a very similar notion, right? One in which, since really, you could say the life and death of Jesus has not had an, a, a single readily agreed upon meaning, right? Sure. Christians have been arguing about what it means to be Christian since Jesus died. Um, and, you know, this goes all the way back to the founding of their religion. But I think at the same time, that argument has allowed the concept and the movement to be as dynamic as it is and to adapt itself to so many different communities and so many um, different nations over time as it has, right? It, it has become, I think, so central to human society, at least human society in many parts of the world, because it's essentially contested. Yeah. Um, and acknowledging that, understanding that it is something that's argued about and fought over um, is, I think, really critical to understanding why it's so important. You know, this is so interesting to me. Last spring during the semester, I had a guest panel of three different Christian pastors. One was a Disciples of Christ pastor, one was a Southern Baptist pastor, and one was a Methodist pastor. And they all would answer the same question from the students in three different ways, and they all acknowledged in the moment how much they were learning from their colleagues in different denominations. And there were three people in the room from three different denominations, and they had three different understandings of the exact same questions from students. I mean, it was really yeah. remarkable. And, and and that, I mean, those are three denominations that are not all that far apart, theologically speaking. Right. right. And I think that that in and of itself illustrates something. You know, if you had, boy, like a, an Eastern Orthodox pastor or a Copt um, there, yeah. you would find, I think, even these definitions go wider and wider and wider. So this definition of... Um what it means to be Christian in America. We've often been, we often heard the terms that the USA is a quote unquote Christian nation and vast amounts of historical figures throughout our history as a nation would argue that American democracy isn't possible without Christianity. And you refer to this as Christian Republicanism. So why does Christian Republicanism matter? And why can we arguably not understand the history of the country without considering the concept of Christian Republicanism with a small R? Mm -hmm. Sure, yes. Uh, this, I mentioned um, earlier the book uh, Making of the American Republic by Gordon Wood, right? And he, and he lays out this notion of republicanism, I think, very well. Republicanism, historically speaking, is a notion that goes back um, really 
into the Renaissance, um, and even arguably, I think, to ancient Rome, because a lot of the people who are writing about it in the Renaissance, in the Renaissance period look to ancient Rome as a model. Um, Republican political ideology is premised on the notion that for self-government to work, for societies to govern themselves, you need a couple of things. You need a high level of civic virtue. You need people to be committed to the public good, and people who are committed to pursuing virtue in their own lives so they can contribute to the public good. Republicanism tends to be a little suspicious of human nature. It tends to think that people are inclined to selfishness, people are inclined to evil, and there has to be a kind of conscious pursuit of virtue to balance that out. Republicanism is really afraid of corruption in politics. It's really afraid that people in politics will try to seize the levers of the political machine for their own benefit and to the detriment of the community. Um, what I, And I'm not the first historian to argue this, to be clear. Um, historians like Mark Knoll and um, oh, George Marzin and others have have made this argument very, very clearly before I have. And I think they're they're right in many ways that in the United States, Republicanism became very, very intertwined with Protestant Christianity, um, that especially evangelical Protestants in the early years of the American Republic took this idea of Republicanism and linked it very closely to being Christian. Um, them, being a Christian and particularly being an evangelical Christian um, provided that virtue and that sense of per discipline and personal morality that made self-government possible. So for them, right, if you were to remove this particular brand of Christianity from American politics, um, we would collapse into a society um, by, that was overcome by corruption and evil and selfishness. So the two are really intertwined for them. Has any of that manifested those concerns? Say that one more time, sorry. Can any of the, have any of those concerns manifested that about the collapse uh, if you remove certain elements of Christianity from society? Oh, you know, and, and this is an interesting question, right? Because it depends on who you ask, mm, interesting. Uh, I think. So if you were to ask these people, right, these evangelical Christians, they would say, absolutely, um, you see this influence, right? Um, but, you know, that could look in, um, oh, it could, it, it looks in, it looks like a different animal from different points in different times. So for instance, take, oh, World War II and the Great Depression and the presidency of Franklin Roosevelt. Um, a lot of conservative white evangelical Christians saw Franklin Roosevelt as being unchristian. Um, they saw him as being unchristian in part because he was not an evangelical. He, um, he, his heritage was from a kind of high Dutch Reformed um, Protestantism. Um, some of them even accused him of being Jewish. Uh, they thought the name Roosevelt was Jewish and that he was you know, a secret Jew, not a Christian at all. And they would point to this and say, look, he is not a Christian. And that is why he is creating a socialist government in our society. Um, they saw the New Deal as being socialist. Uh, they saw the New Deal as being a road to communism. Right. And they linked that to fears that he was not a Christian. And so you can draw a number of scenarios of this, of, of certain people, um, particularly the sorts of people who really believe in Christian republicanism, um, seeing the government doing something they don't like and saying it is because we are seeing corruption because the people running the government are not Christians. Um, Bill Clinton was accused of many of the same things, right? He, and Bill Clinton was a Southern Baptist. He isn't. I mean, he's still alive, so he still is a Southern Baptist. Um, but, you know, he was accused and, you know, in his affairs and all of that of being not a good Christian. And this is why, for many of these um, conservative white evangelicals, um, they thought his government was so corrupt. So this idea of Christian republicanism has, and as these examples might show, has, I think, increasingly become um, rhetoric used by the group that we call the Christian right today. Um, but it has a much, I think, a much broader base than that. It's simply um, a kind of a historical um, development that it has, I think, become the domain of these particular groups in the 20th century. The book takes place 
from like a very particular time in American history from like Reconstruction until today. And I kind of want to talk about a couple of examples throughout history so that people can see how much this has been important. So for Reconstruction, a figure that jumped out at me is Victoria Woodhull. And why should everybody know about Victoria Woodhull? Like what was Christianity and Jesus to her? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I wanted to start the book with somebody who I thought um, might surprise many readers who are expecting a kind of conventional political history. Yeah. Um, she, she's a very interesting figure um, and a semi-famous figure, I would think, but someone who is not does not usually appear in you know conventional stories of American Christianity or American politics, really. Um, but I think she represents a. a a fairly popular movement and in a pretty broad segment of people. Um, Victoria Woodhull was a spiritualist. Um, and spiritualism has more or less completely died out in the United States. Um, it's still around in kind of some esoteric corners, but it's not nearly as large or as popular a movement as it was for quite a while. For oh, about 80 or so years in American history, from the 1830s and 1840s through about World War I, um, spiritualism was very, very popular. Um, it had millions of believers, um, many, many followers over this near century of its history. And spiritualists believed that the spirits of the dead um, were still among us. They believed that the spirits of the dead had entered um, different realms of existence and different realms of being and were still progressing. Um, and that these spirits wanted to communicate this knowledge to us. These spirits want to speak to the living to tell the living that the universe is a progressive place um, and that there is kind of this great chain of being um, leading us all into higher realms of existence that we will discover when we die. So there are many, many very well-known and very popular mediums, people who spoke to these spirits and received guidance from them, and they were um, famous. And Victoria Woodhull was one of these. She was a medium um, who spoke to the spirits. Uh, but she was also a Christian. She mm. called herself a Christian. And there was a, some some spiritualists were not Christian, um, but some were. Um, and the Christian spiritualist movement fit Jesus into um, their worldview. And they believed that Jesus was a good fit. Um, they Some of them spoke of Jesus as being one of these kind of progressed beings who had returned to earth to teach um, human beings um, of the nature of the universe. Um, some said he was a medium himself who could speak to spirits. Um, but they thought that his teachings fit into their worldview. And so Victoria Woodhull argued um, in 1872, she ran for president. Mm -hmm. And I opened the book with that 1872 presidential campaign um, because she brought to that campaign a really wide spectrum of what it meant to be Christian and what Christianity meant for American politics. Um, she was running against Ulysses S. Grant, um, who was presented as very much sort of the avatar of this Christian Republican idea. And another uh, guy named Hor um, named Horace Greeley, who was a newspaper publisher, who also claimed to be Christian. And each one of these people presented a different idea of what Christianity meant mm. and, and what Christianity mandated for American politics. And I, I thought that spectrum set the stage really interestingly for some of the stories I tell later in the book. Yeah, and Victoria Woodhull makes a lot of sense to me. Like, her interpretation of Christianity, like, was jumping off the page at me, and I was like, oh, wow, I kind of agree with Victoria Woodhull and her interpretations. <laughs> um, uh -huh. So let's talk, let's jump forward a little bit, because I know that you spend a lot of time talking about Columbia University and Howard University. How do these two schools become central to the discussions about Christianity in America? Mm hmm. Yeah. You know, I picked these two schools, but I, I thought they presented a really interesting dichotomy that also I think a lot um, of parameters that, that would help to frame what happens later in the book with Christianity and especially this kind of Christian Republican idea that links Christianity really closely to what American politics should be about and how we should think about what it means to be political in the United States. Um, Columbia University during World War I created a course that during the war was called War Issues and after the war is renamed Contemporary Civilization. 
<laughs> this course is really the granddaddy of all the Western Civ courses that are taught in colleges, in, even in high schools in the United States for the rest of the 20th century. Um, it's this sort of broad, sweeping course that traces human history um, from very, very early times to the present. And, you know, when you think about this Western Civ course, and I certainly took it, you may have taken yep. it as well. You may even teach something like it. I have, um, yeah. Yeah. It, when you think about it, the course is not actually what it claims to be, right? It's sort of presented as a broad history of the West. It's actually fairly narrow. The Western Civ course I took began with the ancient Near East, um, with you know the Babylonians and the Egyptians, then moved to ancient Greece, then moved to ancient Rome, and then moved into medieval Europe, and then moved across the ocean to the United States. Yep. And if you if you kind of picture that in your head, what that course is teaching you is that the trajectory of human history began in the Near East, but then moved steadily north and west until it reached the U.S. And by the time you're doing the 20th century, most of what you're doing in these Western Civ courses is focusing on the United States and Northwestern Europe. Correct. Even though you started back in the Near East, right? But you've kind of forgotten about the Near East by the time you've gotten um, to, you know, to 19th century Britain and World War I and all the like. You're not talking about the Near East anymore. That arc was set by Columbia University, and it was set very intentionally because that's what they saw the progress of civilization to be. Mm -hmm. um, they thought, you know, we're going to move the course to follow those, quote unquote, civilizations that are at the forefront, that are the most developed and the most progressed and the most advanced. And of course, that arc is going to end in the United States because they believe American civilization was the most advanced civilization on the globe at that point. But why this to Christianity is that these people also linked that rise of civilization to the rise of Protestantism. Um, and they understood the sort of Protestantism that these Columbia professors were embracing by the early 20th century, which was, which was essentially liberal Protestantism, a variety of Protestantism that downplays the importance of doctrine and instead really places a heavy weight on ethical behavior, on personal morality, on education. They thought that was the highest form of religion. That was the most advanced, most developed form of religion. And they did not think it was a mistake that you can trace the rise of liberal Protestantism from ancient Christianity in the Near East through Roman Catholicism to the Reformation in Germany and in England and then to the United States, which is the same track that the Western Civ courses take. So, so how did – yeah. Yeah, to the extent that these Western civilization courses still exist, and many of them are, are vanishing now, you know, the Western civ is a dying, but they're still teaching that basic narrative. Yeah. So how did Howard University challenge that narrative? Yeah, so Howard University is a historically black university in Washington, D.C. And about the same time that... Western Civ is, is being synthesized in Columbia in this contemporary civilization course. Howard University professors there are trying to offer an alternative. And they are pushing the leadership of their university, which was through the 1920s largely white. Yeah. Um, most of the board of the university was white. The president of the university until the 1920s was white as well. Uh, but many of the professors are African-American, and they are pushing the university to offer more courses in African and African-American history. And they're doing this, again, consciously because they don't agree with that narrative of Western civilization that Columbia University is offering. Um, they argue that as you can see that same arc of progress, what, what Columbia is calling progress, people at Howard are saying, well, that also tracks pretty well onto the rise of slavery. Those same civilizations – 
that Columbia University is saying are so advanced and so moral are also the same civilizations that are driving the slave trade and that are becoming um, slave societies in the United States and, and in uh, many of the other European colonial nations um, in Latin and Central America. So they argue that, in fact, we have to decouple Christianity from this narrative of civilization that Columbia University is offering. They argue that you cannot actually say that Christianity tracks onto the rise of the West. And instead, a very creative professor named William Hansberry at Howard University says, in fact, the most Christian societies that the world has ever seen are in Africa. Hmm. And he points especially to ancient Ethiopia. Um, Ethiopia, as a kingdom, actually became Christian only a few centuries after the death of Jesus. Um, and there is an Ethiopian Orthodox Church that will trace its history back 15, 16, 1700 years. Um, that church was, was separated from the European Christian churches by the rise of Islam, um, but continued to profess Christianity. And Hansberry pointed at them and said, these people, the people in Ethiopia, are truly Christian. And interestingly enough, Hansberry, some of these other professors at Howard, like Elaine Locke, um, were also essentially liberal Protestants um, who believed that Christianity was about ethics and about good behavior and about tolerance. And, and, but Hansberry said, no, the peak of that idea of what Christianity should be is in Africa, not in the United States. Yeah, and you know what? I, I see that uh, the the work of Hansberry and Locke, I almost see that as being very, very ahead of their time because I see those narratives coming out more and more in you know high school history courses as well. Yeah, certainly. As I think world history, which has emerged as kind of an alternative to Western Civ, yeah. right, you will see some of these ideas emerging in that course um, because it's being presented as, I think, a conscious alternative to that old Western Civ course. Yeah. Um, so this develops throughout the decades. In the, in the Great Depression, we see people like Father Charles Coughlin and Father John Ryan um, bickering within the Catholic Church. And then we see the development of Dorothy Day and the Catholic workers. And then leading up to what becomes the Cold War, things tend to move from being strictly Protestant or Catholic and start being referred to as Christian. Do I have that right? Yeah, yeah, uh, in the broad strokes, I think that's right. So is this when, like, um, the public proclamations of piety start to rise while also seeing, like, a reduction in things like biblical literacy and commitment to doctrinal traditions? Like, did it start getting sort of, like, watered down over time about, like, practices and knowledge and then become more of, like, a, um, like a proclamation of public faith or piety? Yeah, to a certain extent, right? And I think that the Cold War is quite interesting here. You, know, you brought up the Great Depression a moment ago, and I think one of the interesting things that I try to point out in the chapter on the Great Depression, which really focuses on, on these Catholics that yeah. you bring up, um, is that for many of these people, particularly Dorothy Day and particularly John Ryan, who are both um, pretty pretty ardent economic justice advocates, right? They're both people who are really pushing um, for a, a more egalitarian economy in the United States. Um, John Ryan wants to do this through government regulation. Um, he's a big booster of the New Deal. Dorothy Day wants to kind of create a sort of spiritual revolution among the American citizenry um, to make them more conscious of the poor. But for both of those people, the specifics of being Catholic was really, really important. And, and I argue, right, that this is one of the reasons why Ryan doesn't gain more traction um, and why we don't really remember John Ryan much anymore is because for Ryan, it, the arguments he was making for this were really deeply rooted in, in papal encyclicals, um, which the Pope had issued, really deeply rooted in specifics of Catholic theology and Catholic doctrine. Uh, that's true for Dorothy Day as well. Um, she's very rooted in this kind of Catholic um, personalist tradition, which is a theological tradition that emphasizes the importance of the individual soul, which is why she cares so much about poverty and homelessness. Um, she believes it's, it's real important to treat these people who are poor um, as individual human beings with human dignity. Yeah, you did a really—yep, really, sorry— 
Oh yeah, go ahead. You did yeah, a really gr- you did a really great service for John Ryan and Dorothy Day in this book because I had really kind of forgotten about the story of Dorothy Day and John Ryan was never taught to me in school. And but I knew mm-hmm. Charles Coughlin, and I was way more impressed with the story of John Ryan in your book than I was with the story of Charles Coughlin. Oh yeah, well Coughlin, I think you know Coughlin was uh, incredibly frustrating to Ryan um, because you know Ryan I think really hoped that he would make a big impact. He really hoped that he would help to sway American politics. Um, but Coughlin is so much more popular than he is. Um, Coughlin, of course, is a, is a radio priest. He has a radio show um, in which he also preaches issues of economic justice, and it becomes immensely popular in the 30s. Um, there is a perhaps apocryphal but still fun, I think, statistic that um, at his peak of popularity, Coughlin was receiving more mail than Franklin Roosevelt, the president, was, mm-hmm. uh, which indicates, I think, the degree of his popularity. Um, but unlike the other two, I think Coughlin is so popular in part because, and this gets to the question you initially asked, he downplays Catholic specifics. Mm. Um, and and that is why Ryan finds him incredibly frustrating and incredibly intolerable, right? Um, Coughlin's grasp of economics was probably a little bit shaky, um, while Ryan had really intensely studied economics and had very well-reasoned positions. Coughlin had never given economics any really intense study. He never really, I think, did the kind of intense, detailed, systematic theological thinking um, that Ryan did either. Um, instead, Coughlin simply talked about Christianity. Mm-hmm. Right? He said the Christian thing to do is this. The Christian thing to do is to help the poor. Um, now, Coughlin was also something of a con, you know, he, a, a conspiratorial thinker. Um, he, by the late 1930s, he was lapsing into anti-Semitism too. He had been attacking Franklin Roosevelt on the grounds and really a, attacking the moneyed elite of the country, um, whom he often labeled as Jewish, um, which is an old, old anti-Semitic trope. But his really broad way of thinking, right, the, the, the language that he used, not really invoking Thomas Aquinas specifics of Catholic theology as much as he simply said, the Bible says this, or he demands that, that allowed him to create this very, I think, ecumenical um, position um, that allowed him to reach a lot of Protestants, and many of his fans were Protestants um, who didn't care that he was a Catholic priest. You know, this is in an era when you know there was still a lot of anti-Catholic suspicion in the country, but Coughlin managed to bridge a lot of those gaps that Ryan couldn't, and that I think then leads us to this question you asked a moment ago about this kind of post-war census where many Protestants begin seeing potential allies in Roman Catholics, and many Roman Catholics begin to kind of downplay um, the particular demands of, you know, theological exclusivism, for instance, or papal suspicion of democracy, which was a thing in the early 20th century, and begin kind of finding that they could claim to be good Americans by being Christian, and, and of course, you know the, the the rise of communism helps this, and Vatican II helps this as well, right? Some of the um, the historical circumstances we see in the Cold War drive the emergence of this consensus, uh, but it certainly is something that starts to emerge um, after World War II. Wow. Okay, so let's kind of go forward a little bit in time to the modern day. So do you see some goals of some Christians shifting with regards to politics? I know there's like sort of like a growing evangelical movement for climate change action, medical care for all as a means of reducing abortion and things like that. Are there any surprising twists that you're noticing in Christian political goals today? Mm. Yeah, well, you know, I think politics and and, this goes back to something I said in the beginning of our conversation, right? Politics and Christianity. When you think about these two things, really for the past 30, 40 years, what you've really thought about is this thing we call the religious right, um, or the you know, um, or the Christian right. 
certainly. And, and the Christian right is an interesting beast. It is, in a lot of ways, this kind of awkward alliance. Um, it's an awkward alliance between theologically conservative Protestants, um, especially Protestant evangelicals, um, who have really been galvanized, I think, on issues of sexuality more than anything else in the last half of the 20th century. Um, Roman Catholics, um, who, and, and I think that alliance is really does really go back to this um, broad post-war anti-communist alliance that those two groups had made, some other smaller groups like Mormons and Seventh-day Adventists, who all have been distressed about, I think, again, more than anything else, shifting ways of thinking about gender um, in America in the last 40 or 50 years. And that encompasses issues of the family, issues of abortion, um, same-sex marriage more recently. Um, you, you, you bring up, though, I think, some more recent shifts that might be happening and problems that this coalition is facing. And I think you're right to do that um, because I think that alliance between these various groups was really, I think, predicated on these issues of gender and sexuality. And for younger members of these groups, as the composition of each of these groups starts to change, I think that issue, issues of sex and sexuality, is becoming less and less important, which means, I think, that some of the natural divides in this coalition are starting to fray. So evangelicals, many of these conservative evangelicals who supported um, making this kind of alliance with Mormons and Catholics still, in some ways, thought that Mormons and Catholics weren't Christian. They were willing to forge, um, and more than anyone else, Jerry Falwell, a Baptist leader, was willing to say, I will work with Catholics and I will work with Mormons because we have common goals. But there were many other people in his, even his congregation in Southern Virginia, who were angry with him for doing that because they didn't believe that Catholics or Mormons were Christian. Hmm. Um, and as then younger evangelicals start to emerge who care less about the issues of sexuality that galvanized Falwell and more about some other issues. You mentioned climate change, and then there is an evangelical, what they call the evangelical stewardship movement um, that is pushing um, evangelicals to more about pollution and the environment, or say issues of immigration, and there are some evangelical groups who care a great deal about refugees and about immigration. And there's also movements within Mormonism on both of these issues as well, and also in Roman Catholicism, um, especially as the composition of Roman Catholicism in the United States changes. It's becoming increasingly Latino. Um, more and more and more Roman Catholics in America are not white or not Anglo. Um, and so that alliance that held this this religious right together for so long is, I think, beginning to fall apart. You know, there's a really interesting... I recently listened to an episode of The Daily, the New York Times podcast, where a woman who identifies as an evangelical Christian in Texas was doing tons of outreach work at the border for refugees that were coming in. And I see that there's a lot of, I feel like there's a lot of fracturing that's going on and a lot of really hard conversations that are happening within the community. Yeah, certainly. And I think, you know, certainly the, the, the statistic that gets thrown around a lot, right, is that 81 percent of self-identified white evangelical Christians voted for Donald Trump for president. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that happened um, because of the story I've been telling, because so many white Christians in America had come to associate Christianity with the rise of the West, right, with the rise of civilization, which they identify as European, as essentially white, right, as American. And they saw Donald Trump as someone who was willing to protect that mm. notion of the West, right, from foreigners, from brown people, um, from people who did not fit that category of being white. You know, and, but I think more younger evangelicals are, are starting to question that. And certainly there, there, there has been, since Trump was elected, a really, really, um, deep schism in the evangelical movement between some leaders who are really horrified by this and uh, some who are very staunch defenders of that vote. Yeah, it seems like a lot of um, people within the community are 
defending the uh, Columbia University version of Western Civ, and then a lot of the younger generations are doing a lot to incorporate the Howard versions as well. So it seems like there's like a melding of the stories that's going to come to a head really soon. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and I think as well, it's important to note right, that the, the country is becoming less and less and less white. And that is true for many of these religious groups as well. Um, this older white movement is in many ways, I think, being um, pushed demographically. Mm -hmm. um, the you know, millennials increasingly are declaring themselves not members of any religious tradition in particular. Um, there is a growing Pentecostal movement, um, which is related to evangelicalism and, and shares a lot of theological ideas with evangelicalism, but is not the same thing. And that Pentecostal movement is happening all over the world and in the United States, and it is increasingly a non-white religious movement as well. So the face of, of who Christians are in the United States is, I think, changing. Um, and that is also putting a lot of strain on some of these older coalitions. Something that jumps out a lot me in the book is that every generation seems to say that the collapse of the American Republic is nigh due to decreasing emphasis on Christianity or whatever their chosen reasons. But right now feels really, really strange and unique. And I try not to panic about this too much because my version, my, my view of history isn't as long as I would like to think. So you're a historian, so you have an extremely detailed and long view of history related to American politics. Does our current moment seem unique to you as someone with a long view of our growth and development over the years? Oh, well, you know, it depends on precisely what you mean by a current moment, right? Precisely what you're referring to by that. There are, yeah. I think, a number of, of different perspectives you could take on this question. Um, certainly in, well, so we can talk about um, political polarization, right? And this kind of political divide and the ways in which Christianity is being mobilized um, on this divide. And in, in that way, you know, you could, I think, draw some parallels with the run up to civil war. Um, in which we became similarly very, very polarized. Not, uh, but, but that polarization then was about region and about economics. Um, I think the one today is much more about culture. Um, and in that sense, I think we're more similar to what happened in the late 1960s. Um, in the late 1960s, you had, I think, similar a similar sense of American cultural transformation happening. Um, and a sense that in many ways, this older vision of what American civilization was, and American civilization was assumed largely to be white, to be Western, quote unquote, um, in that sense was, and, and, and Christian, by, particularly by a lot of evangelical um, and Protestant white Christians, and some Roman Catholics as well, was being challenged by a broader sense of what it mean, meant to be American um, by a growing tide of immigration, um, immigration especially not from Europe. Um, in the mid-1960s, a, a new immigration law called the Hart Seller Act loosened American borders, and you begin to see a lot of people from Asia coming to the United States, and you and you begin to see a lot of growing Asian religious ideas, right? This is when Buddhism and Hinduism begin to enter American conversations, um, and, you know, high-profile people like the Beatles begin to embrace these alternative religious views, and they became really popular um, and perceived by many people to be part of this youth movement, this hippie movement, which a lot of older people perceived as being a real threat to what they understood American civilization to be. I think in that story, you can see a lot of parallels um, to what's happening in the United States today. Are you feeling hopeful or cynical? for our future um you know i think i think um america is going to continue to change i think we are seeing cultural transformations um that in some ways are you know are overcoming a 
are overcoming a narrative that for a long time posited that the United States was different from Europe. That Europe, in Europe, organized religion has been on a decline for a long, long time. I mean, in the United States, we have large that many Americans are still members of religious denominations, but it seems like the millennial generation is following um, that European model more. Now, at the same time, though, that's largely true for white people. Um, Non-white people still tend to be members of religious movements and religious communities at higher rates than white people do. Uh, And so what I think is going to happen is America is going to become an increasingly diverse nation. And it's going to mean we're going to have increasingly broad visions of what it means to be Christian in the United States, increasingly divergent visions of what it means to be Christian. Um, Being Christian may in 50 years not necessarily be associated with a particular religious denomination, but something one does on their own. Um, I'm, I'm hopeful that, you know, Christianity is something which with such a real, a wide range of possible ideas within it, of possible uh, political ideas within it. Um, Christianity inspired these, I think, really, really powerful anti-poverty movements that Dorothy Day and John Ryan advocated for. Christianity inspired, in many ways, the Black Freedom Movement of the 1960s. It, it offered a really powerful vision of human equality to people like Martin Luther King. Um, and I think these ideas are still really potent. Um, and what I would like to see is the word Christian um, come to me more than simply social conservatism, um, which is, I think, what is what it has meant in American politics for the last 20 years or so. Dr. Matthew Bowman, it has been a real pleasure uh, having you on Classical Ideas to talk about your new book, Christian, The Politics of a Word in America. I'm so grateful to you for your time today. Oh, appreciate it. It's been fun. Thank you. Classical Ideas is produced by me, Greg Soden. Music on Classical Ideas is composed and performed by Derek Streibig. You can find his music at www.wearewarmmusic.com. If you like this show, please rate it on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can email me at classicalideas at outlook.com or find me on Patreon at patreon.com slash classicalideaspodcast. Thanks so much for listening.